welcome to another of my tabletop RPG lectures. I am Jason Bolin, the director of game design at Paizo. I uh, created the Pathfinder role-playing game, and I manage the team that makes Pathfinder 2nd Edition. I've been doing this for a while, and today I'd like to talk about something that's near and dear to my heart, which is making cool magic items. Um, I think of all of the things that you can uh, have fun with in a fantasy role-playing game, magic items are really kind of... Uh, they live in a special niche all to their to their own. Uh, they are um, a thing that can be much talked about and much uh, remembered about really any session. Um, magic items can make or break a campaign. Um, you know, a good magic item can be a highlight of the story, can be something that's talked about for years, whereas a bad broken magic item can send your whole campaign off the rails and into the deep end. So uh, before we get into the specific parts, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the, the function that magic items fulfill in the game. Um, their first and primary function in the game space, and this is kind of why they're so unique, is that magic items break the rules, right? Um, the player characters are built and structured around this kind of neat, tidy framework. In, in whatever game you're playing, the, the player characters are built kind of by strict rules that dictate one they can and can't do. But magic items are the way that you just throw those rules out the window and are like, hey, you want to fly? Cool, here's this nifty cloak, and now you can fly. Um, you know, they are something that allows a character to really expand their skill set in ways that uh, the rules otherwise don't let them do. Um, and in that, they're, they're pretty unique, right? I mean, we don't, generally speaking, put in other ways that you can just randomly break the rules, and we certainly don't put them in the hands of, of players. We usually reserve those for, for GM boons and benefits and special abilities. Magic items are kind of how we put that all in a tidy little box and deliver it to you. Um, the other thing about magic items is um, in a game system that features leveling as one of its primary reward components. Yeah, you get XP, and XP is nice, but XP isn't immediate. It, it has no instant gratification, not like a magic item. Magic item is, the moment you get it, you've got more power right now. You can start using that the very next session, the very next encounter. Um, magic items offer a kind of uh, an instant hit, that instant dopamine hit that your character just became more powerful right now. It's kind of an intermediate way to kind of power up your character. And I think good magic items also uh, have an air of mystery about them. I think it's it's really easy for a magic item to just be, ah, eh, here it is, it's a it's a cool sword, it's, it starts on fire, and it's a plus two. You know, that, that's great. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, but the but the really the really captivating magic items are the ones that you kind of don't know everything about. The GM gives it to you with kind of a you know a wry look on his face, like here you go, here's an interesting item, and you're excited to use it, and it's powerful, but it almost seems too good to be true, probably because it is, and that's kind of some of the fun and excitement of magic items. But when it all when it's all said and done, how do you keep magic items exciting and new? How do you prevent them from just becoming this rote kind of ordinary component? I think in a lot of campaigns, that's what they end up being. It's like, oh, we finally got the plus one cloak. Oh, we finally got the plus two shield. You know, so much of that becomes kind of formulaic. Uh, I think when you look back at like Pathfinder First Edition, that was like the 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 biggest uh, point of that was the items that just gave you stat boosts, right? You know, it's like oh, you plus two strength belt. No, it's plus four strength belt. Now it's plus six strength belt. That was such a formulaic part. There's nothing interesting or exciting about it. It's just a naked power boost that isn't really that exciting. Not in the way that magic items can be. So, you know, when everybody has the books, when all the lists in those books are known by every player at the table, how do you prevent magic items from becoming rote? I'm going to tell you. So, uh, we're going to start this out with part one, and uh, part one is just identifying the types of magic items. And I don't mean uh, rods or swords or, you know, uh, staves or potions or scrolls. That's not the type I mean. 
What I'm more talking about is how the magic items relate to the core of the game, how, how they relate to the engine. And I'm really talking about Pathfinder here, but to be honest, this applies to D&D just as well. Um, it applies to most fantasy games with, with, with magic items in them. And I think that magic items come in three categories. The first, and the most basic by far, are just bonus items. These items just give a bonus to a number, usually. They make a character better at a thing that they're already good at. That's where they usually get used. The other end of that spectrum is when the items are used to cover up for a thing that the character is intentionally bad at. Think of, uh, you know, uh, uh, oh, it's a cloak that gives you a bonus on fort saves. Well, you can give that to the fighter, but the fighter already has really good fort saves, so you might want to give it to the wizard to cover up for the weakness of their fort saves. Something like that. Those are, those are bonus items. And really, these items, their entire point is just to fiddle with the numbers. Most games have the assumption that you get some of these items as part of their core assumptions, right? Pathfinder 1st Edition and 2nd Edition both have certain built-in assumptions that the player characters have access to various bonus items as they go up in level. They're not incredibly satisfying, I'll be honest. They're, we actually tried really hard to tamp down on them with 2nd Edition, because in 1st Edition they kind of ran rampant. Um, but these are, generally speaking, not incredibly exciting items. They just give a bonus, and that's what they do. Um, next up, the second category of items, I would say, is uh, what I like to call feature items. And what these are is they give access to a cool rules thing. Um, they, uh, something that is usually identified with something that another character can already do, right? So the cloak that, uh, of the bat that lets you, you fly for a bit or the boots that allow you to do the same thing, right? Uh, these items, um, allow you to gain access to abilities that other characters can get via their choices. So you might have a sword that, uh, that while wielding it, you fight very well with that sword. That would be a feature item because... Well, the fighter can already fight well with swords, and maybe this weapon is of no use to him. But you give it to the you give it to the you know the cleric, and all of a sudden it's uh, that cleric is a much more competent fighter. Um, but this applies to other things as well. They also give additional uses or additional functionality to what a class already can do. Scrolls are a feature item. What do they do? They just give you one extra casting of a spell. You already have to know how to cast that spell. This just makes you do more of the thing your class already does. The game has a lot of these, and they do serve a valuable purpose because they're coded, right? When one of these items drops on the table, everybody kind of already knows who it's going to go to. As a GM, that makes it really valuable because it allows you to kind of target some items for characters that maybe didn't quite get the share of the treasure that you were hoping they were going to get earlier on in play. I'll talk more about that later when I talk about giving out items and, and how to balance that out. but. These items are really good at, at spreading the love around and making sure that all the magic items don't get consolidated in one set of hands. Uh, the last set, and I, I, to be honest, I find this to be some of the most interesting uh, magic items, are uh, the function items. And uh, these items are... Um, not really either of the previous two. These just, they do one strange thing, usually related to their form or tied to like lore or story. Um, these, these items are just interesting. They're, they're not mechanically powerful usually. They're just... They have something interesting that they can do. So like a mug that fills with ale when they're on command. Uh, a bag that holds a lot. And one might even call it a bag of holding. Um, a ring that rams things. All of these are examples of items that just do something cool or evocative. But they're not really anything that fits into either of the two above categories. Um, these can be very, very interesting items. But it's also really easy for these items to get entirely sidelined, viewed as marginal at best, and they end up, uh, you know, in the back of the bag and sold off at the nearest town for to, to raise money to buy some of the other items. So uh, those are the three types that I tend to look at when I think about magic items. Um, there, there are obviously 
uh, you know, hybrids and things like that, things that have bits of, of each category in it. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but before we move on, uh, let's recap. Uh, so, uh, magic item types, uh, focusing on their role in the game. You have bonus items. Uh, these usually give a boost to a core attribute. These are numerical in nature. Uh, you have feature items. These give access to a special ability. Usually something one of the PCs can do, either giving it to a character that isn't proficient in those things or giving additional use to a character that is. Uh, and finally, you have function items. They just do something neat. Uh, and uh, they're tied to form or a point of lore. So uh, let's move on to uh, the second part. Building the items. Um, so you kind of know what the types are and, and when you start building an item it's real tempting to start with like oh what level is it how much does it cost how does it build um i think it's real easy to get lost in the kind of frankly less important parts of the item which can cloud your vision of you know making the item as cool as it possibly can be um so the, the real challenge here when designing new items is you have to compete uh, with the character's desire to have bonus and feature items that play exactly to their strengths. Those things have an outsized value uh, in the player's psyche. And as a result, like you can have a cool sword that does interesting things but it's not necessarily going to win out against, you know, the plus three sword. The plus three sword is boring, but it hits more uh, and does more damage and is kind of more effective than the cool sword that, you know, just bursts into flames and, you know, can shoot a ray of fire once per day. That's interesting, but you're always competing against kind of the game's benchmarks. So, and, and those usually are bonus and feature items. Um, bonus items in particular. Uh, so there's lots of ways you can start this process. Um, you can start by thinking about the shape of the object. What is it? Is it a spoon? Is it a sword? Is it a shield? Is it a bag? Is it boots? Is it belt? What is it? What is the item? You can start by coming up with a cool ability you'd like to add to the game. That's certainly a way. And then you fill in what the item is uh, after that. You can even start with just a cool name. Oh, it's the skull of... Ergon Daskar. What's it do? I don't know, but it sounds cool, and now I have a weird skull, and you know, maybe it has necromancy powers. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe it has the ability to see or can float, and you can send it around. I, I don't know. But you can start with just the name, or just the description, or an ability, and you can just backfill around those things. Um, all of those are valid, but I, I think it's most useful to start with thinking about what it is you're trying to make. Think about it from that type perspective. Am I trying to make a new bonus item? Am I trying to make a feature item? Am I trying to make an item with a cool function? That last one I think is the most important and the most fertile for uh, our, our discussion here today. But let's start with the other two. So let's say you're trying to make a new bonus item. I think this is the most challenging thing for a GM to do for a couple reasons. First of all, um, how is it not just a copy of another item that already exists? Because most games have a handful of uh, focus, or sorry, bonus items already built into the game. They already have plus weapons, they already have plus armor, they already have things that give bonuses to skills and saving throws and things like that. So these are very challenging because the moment you give one out, it's going to be directly compared to what the players already have. If it is not numerically superior, they probably won't use it. If it is numerically superior, then you've probably just bloated your game. So it's a real uh, trick in figuring out where the right line is with these. Because they involve numbers, it's easy for players to do a direct comparison. And that makes your job even harder. And there is an answer here. The answer is to look for a smaller numerical bonus, but tie it into something cool and thematic, some ability that it can do. So, you know, let's say you've got, uh, you know, the plus, uh, you know, the, the plus four boots of stealth, 
They've already got a pair of plus four boots of stealth, so you can't give them another plus four boots of stealth. Instead, you give them a plus three boots of stealth. That, in addition, uh, you know, once per day, uh, they can, you know, turn you invisible, or they can allow you to re-roll a stealth check. Now, all of a sudden, there's a comparison there that the players might go, eh, the plus one isn't quite worth that cool ability, that cool ability makes me maybe want to consider downgrading to the smaller numerical bonus and getting the cool special ability. There's lots of different ways you can take that, right? You know, you can have a belt that, uh, yeah, it gives you a bonus to your strength, but uh, it's not as big. But in addition, once per day, you can increase your carrying capacity to 10 times the normal amount for a minute. So you can lift up a rock and move it out of the way, right? You can all do all sorts of interesting stuff. And maybe that becomes something that the players are willing to consider. That's how you make bonus items work. I think those are the biggest challenge though. Of all three of the categories, I think bonus items are the ones that are the hardest to design because usually the games beat you to it. The game has already made a bunch of these and they are already uh, taking up uh, you know, space in the game. So designing new ones is a big challenge. Next up, uh, let's talk about making new feature items. The challenge with feature items, um, you know, first of all, many classes, you know, especially if it's like, oh, it's a it's a loot that allows you to use bardic performance a couple extra times per day or, or enhances it or something like that. A lot of these items, once again, they're already in the game. That doesn't mean there isn't room to do something cool and new. Oh, this is a, this is a, 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 a you know, a, a holy symbol that allows you to cast an extra cantrip if you worship the right deity. That's cool, that's interesting. Um, you know, there are ways you can add new things like that. Um, if they're not tied specifically to a character, so if they're not like a scroll where you already have to be able to cast the spell to use the scroll, if there's something more generic like, oh, this is this cool holy symbol that allows you to smite like a paladin once per day, that's cool, but I think the real challenge here is you have to be careful in what you give out so as to not make other characters entirely obsolete. Let's say you put on a flute that's like, cool, this lets you uh, do bardic performance, even if you're not a bard. And the bard in the party's like, hey, uh, that's my shtick. Can you please not do that? Because if it doesn't end up on the bard or the bard doesn't end up using it, then all of a sudden the bard has become less of a character because you've given away some of their core features to someone else. I think there are some things that are far less central to a character that it's fine to give out, right? The ability to fly, the ability to throw a fireball. Some of these things are uh, something that the game already does. It's already a, a built-in assumption. There are generally limits into what it can do. And in some cases, it's there to help facilitate the broader narrative structure. And you can always look for things like that. Now there is a, uh, an easier answer as well, uh, and that's to put some limits on the power of the item, right? Let's say you really do want that, uh, that flute that uh, allows you to do bardic performance, and it is really important, but you don't want to obsolete the bard. I mean, maybe. Uh, but uh, let's say you, you do want to find a way to put that in the game. The easiest way to make that a balanced item or something that makes sense is that it's limited. Maybe it can only be used once per day for just one short performance, and that's it. Uh, you know, or another way you can do it is place the item at a lower power level than the equivalent that a character currently has. So um, if it does bardic performance, and let's say you can do it all the time, but it's much less powerful than the current level of bardic performance, and it's a higher level item, that means by the time the players get it, or by the time they find it in the game, the characters have already grown past it. And what it does is then it gives you a taste of what they can do without stealing the spotlight, right? Which is the one thing you don't want magic items to do. You don't want the magic items to become more important than the characters themselves. So when you're building feature items, that's my advice. Look for interesting things that characters can do that you can build onto, that you can tack onto. Oh, cool! This is a this is a pair of boots that when you use, you know, a sudden charge, instead of moving twice your speed, you can move up to three times your speed, and that is a valid item that only works for fighters. You have to have sudden charge to even make it work. 
Um, you could make it uh, work for other characters by saying, oh, it allows another, if you don't have sudden charge, you can use sudden charge once per day. That's also an interesting magic item right there. That, that works. That makes sense. That's a good feature item. It doesn't obsolete the fighter because the, the, the person next to him isn't doing it all day. And if the fighter does have it, it makes what they can already do a little better. All right, let's move on to talking about function items. These are by far the most, this is by far the most fertile ground as a GM you will find. This is the area where you really do have a broad depth that you can build uh, into. So, um, you know, th this is also the area where it's hardest to give guidelines uh, because really it can be anything. Um, you can think of literally any common object and turn it into a magic item that either does what it's supposed to do better or does it without uh, without uh, uh, guidance, without anyone having to work it, right? Like, you know, the, the mug of ale, uh, the, the magic en enchanted mug that fills up with ale every day isn't a powerful item. It's not going to break the game. But it is something that, the you know, the, the, the dwarf fighter in the group's going to want because it allows him to have his mug of ale even in the middle of a dungeon. Um, you know... The, the, the question you have to ask yourself here when building a function item is why was it made? What purpose does it serve? And how might the characters subvert that purpose to their own ends? Um, when brainstorming up uh, ideas for this lecture, I was talking about a butter churner that churns itself. That's it. You pour milk in and it just, it makes butter. That's what it does. And it, it, it is that powerful? No, no, that's nothing the characters are going to look at that like why would i why would i want that and it's like well you wouldn't but the person who uh you know has a lot of cows and has a lot of butter to churn well they'd like that item it makes their job a lot easier and that's where a lot of function items can come from is this place of like how would people actually take magic and use it to make their lives easier those are going to be some of the most interesting magic items you put in the game they won't necessarily break your game. They won't. Um, they won't twist the world in a way that it doesn't doesn't make sense. But but they will um, kind of add a, a verisimilitude to the world. It, it gives it the right kind of texture. So um, you know, uh, and and your players will surprise you with these. That's why they're so much fun. So take the magic butter churner. Uh, it doesn't sound like that's a very useful item. But if you had that item in a dungeon and you needed to create a noisy distraction in one part of this uh, room so that the monsters were lured to it, uh, maybe the sound of churning butter would get the monsters to go investigate. I don't know, but it, it is a way that you'll be surprised how the players will use these items in, in, in shocking and fascinating ways. Um, and that's what makes them so much fun. Um, so it, it, I like, whenever I build these things, I like to think of it from the angle of how would common folk uh, who had enough money pay an enchanter to make their lives easier? That's one entire category of items. The other category of items though is how would adventurers who have money make magic items to make their lives easier or to make their lives simpler, right? Having, having a, a, you know, a, a, a silver hand that you can attach to a door handle and then stand back and speak the command word and it magically opens up the door to trigger any traps, that's a really useful item. Might be too useful, in fact. So you do have to think about these things directly from the angle of how will the players use them to break the game because they're going to try and find ways to do so. I, I, the story I like to tell is of the, uh, the immovable rod. The immovable rod is a pretty innocuous item. When you press the button, it stays in place no matter where it is. You can tell that the initial design intent of this item was, well, you could, you could hang it up over a pit, tie a rope to it, and use it to swing across to the other side. Really handy, really useful. You can break the game really bad with that magic item. It is really easy to mess up storylines and plot points with that item. Oh, this boat is uh, is is trying to get away, and I'm on it. Well, I'm just going to activate this magic item, and now this thing's going to tear through the boat and rip it open. 
oh, this monster is trying to chase us down this tunnel. Well, I'm just going to hold it up in the middle of the tunnel and let it go. And now the monster literally can't get past. The tunnel is not wide enough for it to get on either side of this thing, right? Oh, the door. No, let's just close the door. I'll close the door, put it on the other side, activate it, and now no one can open up the door. Like, there are a lot of ways that this, this relatively simple item can actually break your game. When you're thinking about interesting, cool function items, make sure to think about them from that angle. Oh, the mug that produces ale. Well, you probably need a rider on there that says, yeah, you can't just pour the ale out. It, this isn't the, I now have an ale making business, right? Oh, I just wrecked the economy. No, if it doesn't get poured directly into someone's mouth, it doesn't work, right? There's lots of things that you can do that are just simple fail safes when you're building items like this. I think this is the area of the other three. The biggest challenge here is 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 how do you keep these uh, interesting without breaking your game. So um, let's talk about you know wh where you go from here. So you you've you've thought about what type of item you want to build. You've got a rough idea in your head of what it's supposed to be doing. How do you how do you make that fully come into being? Uh, the thing I'm not going to do here is get into like leveling and pricing. It varies wildly based on your game. I suggest you just learn it. And the best trick I can offer you is the one that doesn't require any game knowledge, which is compare it to other items. And when you hit the point where you would never take it by, as opposed to the other items of that rough price band or level point, you've probably found the right spot. Like you want it just to be on that edge where it is a, ah, maybe I take this, maybe I take that. If I'm looking at all the seventh level items, it's pretty comparable to the other seventh level items. If I put it on the eighth level list, I'm never taking it. I'm always taking the eighth level items. And you know, if, but if I put it on the fifth level list, I'm always taking it as opposed to any of the fifth level items. That's usually the easiest way to, to gauge whether or not your item is priced right or leveled correctly, if your game has that sort of stuff. Um, so, um, the one of the things that I always like to do when I'm designing items is, uh, before we get away from the types bit, is I like to look and see whether or not there are obvious blends, right? Bonus items with interesting function features. Um, <laughs> I just said all three words. That doesn't work. Uh, interesting bonus items that have a function component to them uh, is really interesting. Uh, feature items can oftentimes have bonuses or function, right? You know, you can blend these in interesting ways to kind of make items that are far more than one category would recommend, right? So if you are going to give out a cool sword that has a really interesting function style purpose to it, you probably want to make sure it at least has some amount of bonus that makes it not a terrible choice for the level that you want to give it out at. Otherwise, they just won't use it. And that is the, the most challenging part of designing and balancing an item is, you know, putting a cool item in the game and then having uh, the players just throw it in the bag and discard it and not pay attention to it. And the moment they get back to town, they sell it because they really have their eye on this new set of armor, right? That's that's kind of the worst. You, you really don't want that to happen. There's nothing more depressing as a GM than spending your time doing that. And you can save yourself the headache by just making sure that it is competitive with, with the other items uh, around that level. So once you've got all these things kind of worked out, uh, the other way you can really make a magic item pop is by adding quirks and details. Um, does the item always work? You know, are there drawbacks? Does it have a side effect when you use it? Um, you know, quirks can make an item unusable if you go too far, but if you do just the right amount, then it becomes an interesting piece of flavor, right? So instead of looking for a way to uh, use a quirk to balance the item, you probably want to build that into its core, Quirks should really be there to add texture, to add subtext to an item. So, oh, well, that, that mug that produces ale uh, all the time. Well, the ale always has this weird taste of juniper to it. Why? Don't know. That's just what it does. And maybe that speaks to its story or its history. You can, you can decide those things on the fly. You can figure out what those mean. And maybe they don't mean anything. Uh, you know, maybe the cool uh, cloak that uh, allows you to, you know, soar through the air when you turn back 
uh, from the its bird form back into a, uh, a person. Uh, there's a poof of feathers that fly in every direction. Does it do anything? Nah, but there's feathers everywhere, so everybody knows where you've been. That's interesting. Not breaking. Not, uh, not traumatically game altering but it does make the item more interesting than just here is its mechanical description and we're done also deciding what the item looks like and giving it an interesting signature appearance can really go a long way um you know um the you know it, it's one thing to be like oh it's a it's a you know it's a it's a wooden rod with a, a, a emerald up at the tip Great. Well, that's you, you've gone halfway there. Um, oh, it's a wooden rod that uh, looks carved at one end, but the other end looks like it slowly transforms into this gnarled branch that is holding this emerald, this massive emerald that is part still embedded in the stone from which it was carved. Um, you know, that is now a far more interesting item to visualize. Don't be afraid to embellish with some detail. Um, it, it, it's not really a surprising piece of advice but you'll be surprised how often uh folks ignore it now the last bit is uh how do you how do you make sure this is a good part of the game and really you know most of us don't have the luxury of doing a play test right um if you do great if you can if you can give it out in a uh uh, in a, a consequence free way and then not have to worry about it later and kind of observe what it does to the game space fine great cool you can also use message boards for that like post up the item hey this is what i'm thinking about doing can anyone see any ways to break this i am sure there are plenty of places you know you can just go to reddit and start a thread and you'll get all the advice you need um but what most of us end up having to do is uh play test it live right you put it into play and you let the players play with it and see what happens. This uh, can be uh, really exciting and really a lot of fun. It can also totally break your game, right? I, I, I know for a fact I've given out magic items that were like, that was too good, that was too powerful, that did things I didn't expect to do. Um, I think the thing that you have to remember here, just like in all things being a GM, it's okay to retcon things. It's okay to go in and fix things, especially if they're breaking your game. It's better to live with the retcon than to live with a broken game. Um, you know, don't let something that's broken and clearly, you know, being abused by your players uh, derail all the other work you've put in. It's okay to go back in and change things. You can even explain this away if you want. Right? You can say, oh, you know, this cool, weird magic item, it's kind of unstable. Who knows what's going to happen with it over time, and over time its powers change, because you're tuning them and adjusting them and saying, oh, it can't actually do that thing anymore. Sorry, the uh, the fact that you could fill up cask after cask with your, you know, juniper ale is is too broken. I need to, I need to rail that in, and it stopped functioning in that way, or now it only produces two cups a day. You overextended the magic of it, right? That's perfectly fine. So, to sum up, building new items. Don't start with the cost or level, start with what the item does. Think about its type. Bonus item, you know, must compete with other bonus items. Feature items, you have to watch out for breaking the game, but you have to find cool, evocative things to um, uh, allow it to do. Uh, function items, uh, what will make the PCs want to keep it, right? I think that's something that's always worth thinking about. Uh, and that goes for any magic item, to be honest. That it, It's most true with function items. It's real easy to get PCs to keep a bonus item. Just make the bonus really good, and they'll keep it. I, I guarantee. Um, but it, it, it can be very hard to get them to keep a function item because they don't see the immediate use of it. That butter churner is probably getting sold, right? The, the magic butter churner is probably getting sold. But if they keep it and they find a use for it, I guarantee you they are never selling that item. They are going to keep it till the end of their days and they are going to find 85 ways to use it. <laughs> yeah, you can also just make it so they can't get rid of it. It's cursed. <laughs> you get to keep it forever now. I think I think that's a trick you get to pull once as a GM. Uh, make sure to think about blending the types of items. You know, it's a bonus item that has some cool function to it. It's a feature item that has fun function to it. You know, there, there's lots of ways that you can mix that up and blend it around. Uh, add quirks, you know, uh, maybe the, maybe the item works every day of the year except one. Why is that? You don't know. 
but you might be able to find out. Maybe there's a story there. Uh, add interesting details. Describe how it's made, what it looks like. Um, you know, uh, give it an evocative, uh, you know, texture or smell or, uh, you know, whenever it's used, the air fills with some odd scent. That sort of stuff is, is, is fantastic for storytelling purposes. Uh, and then, you know, either play test it or adjust it in play, right? There's nothing wrong with that. You know, take a look at the player character sheets. Um, see what other things they have and think about how this item might relate to those other things. That in and of itself might tell you all that you need to know before adding it to your game as to whether or not you're going to have uh, any particular problems. So, let's get to the last part here. And that's uh, giving out the magic. Giving magic. Um... I think this is this is I'm gonna be a little light on this because I think mostly it depends very heavily based on the game that you are playing, um, but I, I, at its heart, the, the the hardest part of assigning magic items to be in a loot uh, pile is trying to balance uh, give a, give a good balance between the items that you know the players want versus the things that would be fun in play. They're rarely exactly the same thing. The players are going to want, you know, their plus two swords and their plus three armors, and, and, and they, they, they want those bonus items. They know they want them. They've been, in fact, trained that those things are super critical to the play experience. They will feel less powerful without them. So you have to balance giving those items versus also including, you know, your silver ravens and your weird compasses and your, you know, strange, you know, shovels, right? You know, all of those weird things that ultimately are actually a lot more fun, but the players aren't going to immediately see them as valuable. Um, you know, players at their heart hoard items, but the moment something becomes more valuable than its use, it's probably going to get sold. Uh, if that's allowed in your game. I mean, it might not be, in which case, what ends up happening is everything you give them just ends up in a bag. And that's kind of the opposite end of this, which is the moment they have a, a, a way to, to throw things in a bag, they just live in a bag. And maybe they remember that they have it, but maybe they don't. I can't tell you how many times I've run sessions where the players had the perfect magic item to get them out of the situation they were in, and they forgot they had it. Like, no one remembered that that was in their bag. And then, like, two sessions later, they're like, Oh my god, we would have solved that thing. We would have gotten out of the water dungeon so easy had we just remembered we had those, you know, the, the potion of mist form. We just could have gone through the grate and opened it. It would have been great. But they forgot. So, you know, that, that happens all the time. Um, so, it, you know, it's, it's best to make the items really evocative and something that is in the forefront of the players' minds. Um but not so valuable that they automatically consider selling it to get a better bonus item. Um, so I, I think that's the, the hardest part, is balancing out giving the players what they need alongside the right things that would be fun. Now another trick is to look forward into the future of your game and to use that to inform what items you give them now. I can't tell you how many times I've played an adventure or how many times... Um, I have, you know, finished this epic quest. Oh, we defeated the dragon. Let's go through the dragon's horde. What's in here? Oh, a dragon slaying sword. What? That's not useful to me anymore, right? It's like, oh, thank you. This would have been great two weeks ago before we had to fight the dragon, right? I, giving them the tools they need for the future uh, is really going to pay off well. And this requires both some guesswork on your part and some subtlety. You don't want everything you give them to be, you know, clutch in the future. Not every object they get their hands on is the one object they need to solve uh, the, 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 the dungeon that they're going into next week. If you do that too much, they'll suddenly get suspicious of every item you give them. <laughs> So you want to keep that be a mix. You want it to be, oh, there is one thing in there that is going to be useful to them sometime in the future. But there's also three things in there that are just interesting, fun, utilitarian things. Um, and it'll be interesting because those things can also be less powerful than their benchmark stuff for that level. 
So if they have, you know, oh, they've got a uh, plus two swords, but they find this weird plus one sword that does, you know, a whole bunch of extra damage against lycanthropes. I'm thinking back to those old weapons. They're like, plus one, plus four versus lycanthropes, right? They got a plus three weapon. They're using that all the time. Until they run into lycanthropes, then they're breaking out that weird weapon because it's slightly better. That works too. Um... Once you've given out the items and once the players have them, if you really want them to start looking at their equipment a little bit more differently, you have to make sure that you're super permissive within reason. Uh, when it comes to improvisation, when they do something weird or interesting with their item that makes sense, that has a reasonable chance of success, let it work. Give them a good chance of success. Let them try it. That is a great way to encourage them to look at their magic items in a new light. They suddenly start looking at those function items in a different way and going, that's really cool. I, I never thought that I could use that in such a way, right? You know, the, uh, oh, this is the, the you know, the pipe that whenever you, you smoke it, it can be used to, uh, you know, create messages in the smoke that hang in the air for an hour. Well, they could use that to leave messages for each other, right? You know, th there's interesting things that they could do with that. That someone's chasing them and they're using that pipe to taunt the people who are behind them because they will chase up and see the message. That's fun. You should encourage that sort of stuff. Um, using their items in new and interesting ways is half the fun of having the items. But finally, you have to monitor how these items are being used. And like, as much as I want to say, let them do crazy cool stuff, you also have to make sure it's not breaking your game and they don't turn it into a crutch that they use to solve all their problems. If, you know, that immovable rod is wrecking a bunch of your games, you're going to want to look for a way to remove that from play or change it or get around it uh, because it, eventually it gets stale and it becomes a crutch as opposed to doing, you know, their, their the hard work of being an adventurer. If they have a lamp that summons a genie that can fight for them, uh, you know, uh, and they just start using that over and over and over again, uh, and they don't bother fighting themselves, they just let the genie go fight things, well, you're probably going to want to find a way to limit that so that uh, the players actually get back in on the fun. So don't be afraid to adjust your plans as you go and change how things work. Um, you know, come up with good rationale for it when you can. Uh, but there is a point where as GM you just have to kind of go, all right, everybody, fun's over. Um, th this has been broken and I have to change how this works. Otherwise the game just starts losing its cohesion. So, you know, magic items are kind of a double-edged sword like that, but, uh, you know, with a bit of patience, uh, and a bit of, uh, forethought, uh, you can make it work. Uh, you know, uh, I, j I was just thinking the other day that, uh, I've kind of given the players a weird magic item in, uh, in my Band of Bravos game, the game I'm running on the Paizo Twitch stream, and they have a skull that has a ghost in it. And they haven't really thought about it all that much yet, but they haven't, they haven't really tried to break the game with the ghost yet. Now, I've already got some limits in my head about what the ghost can and can't do, but at its heart, it's basically a magic item that has a ghost in it that can talk to them. And it's snarky, and it doesn't like working with them, and he, he, he's, he's, he's not exactly the, the friendliest of sorts. But he is a ghost, and that is going to, at some point in time in the future, afford them some pretty unique things. They haven't really figured it out yet, but they will. And I, I'm looking forward to it. So, to, to sum up, uh, part three here... Giving out magic items, uh, the, the biggest challenge is balancing need versus fun. Figuring out what the players need, making sure they get enough of that, so that the fun things don't immediately get sold off to buy the things they need. Um, uh, you know, looking forward uh, into your campaign to see what they might need in the future, uh, and giving that to them before they need it. Um, the the dragon slaying sword shouldn't be in the first room of the dragon's lair. The dragon wouldn't keep it there. But if you put it in the tomb of the ancient warrior king that they explored two months ago, suddenly it all makes sense and it works. Uh, encourage them to improvise. Uh, you know, let them use their items in fun and novel ways. Uh, but keep an eye on the overall impact. Keep an eye on, on how those things are going to deform and deflect uh, your game. Don't be afraid to change things. So, I think that about wraps up my uh, primary bit of lecture here. I think what we're going to do is we're going to open it up to some Q&A. 
So we'll go ahead and bring that back. We got everybody here in uh, chat talking about uh, snarky genies and oh my poor uh, my poor band of Bravos players. They don't think a lot yet. They'll get there. They'll get there. I have faith in them. They'll they'll figure it out maybe one of these days. So if anybody in chat has questions about magic items and uh, designing them or the pitfalls around them, I'd be happy to answer them. We got about eh, about tenish minutes uh, left here. Um, so uh, the question uh, is about uh, relics and items that grow with you uh, that have been in a variety of games. The the GMG introduces relics to Pathfinder Second Edition. This is something we've toyed around with a, a, a lot. Um, so uh, I love the idea of relics. As a matter of fact, I tried to build them into the core of Pathfinder Two. Um, I love the idea of an item that you get that grows with you in power as you grow. I think the big challenge with these is um, if you design them right, they can be a perfect companion to the player character's growth and their chart of growth. But you have to be careful so that it doesn't seem like it's just, here's the MacGuffin that gives you every cool ability you ever wanted. Um, it feels a little too planned if you're not careful with it. So it should do weird and interesting things, but within a very tightly focused theme. And that's kind of fun. Um, as far as how you balance that with the game's economy, basically I just assume that that becomes a thing that takes out of the wealth of the party throughout its lifespan because it's being paid for that way. Um, just so that we're not dumping extra treasure on the party. I also think the biggest challenge with doing those sorts of items is what if you were only if you only give out one of them and no one else gets one? It doesn't feel very fair to the rest of the players. Um, they should all be getting fun and interesting things if you're going to do that sort of stuff. Uh, Lightning Lancer asks about uh, using runes on magic items. How do you balance those? I'm assuming you mean uh, the, the route of like, oh, rune, this is a rune you put on the item and now the item does something extra. Uh, for Pathfinder, that's how we do that in second edition. Runes are how you add powers to magic items and you can take runes off and add rune and, and, and uh, add new runes to items. Um, I think for those... Uh, the easiest way to keep those exciting and interesting is just to look what else is out there and find niches that aren't being occupied. Uh, as far as balancing them, uh, once again, it, it, it comes back to my, my the, the best advice I can ever give anybody to balance anything within an existing game system is to look at the other equivalent things and find the right sweet spot where it's not better than everything else at its level and it's not worse than everything else at its level. Uh, uh, sounds simple but it's actually a, a very complicated little guessing game as you scale it up going eh, is it better than these things eh, maybe maybe oh no now it's definitely not good enough right i've gone too far um uh p fred relics and intelligent items are they something i like to use yes i i actually like intelligent items quite a bit and this this ties back into the lecture i gave last week about npcs and that how you should always be looking for a way to put npcs in your adventures even if it doesn't make sense for the story for there to be an npc to interact with intelligent magic items are oftentimes an easy way to get around that it is uh, intelligent items are a way for you to inject role playing into a magic item the magic item has cool powers and abilities you should still build it with those in mind but there's now a consciousness associated with it and that consciousness can turn up the item or powers can turn them down can do all sorts of interesting things that uh, then you as a gm have an interesting lever to play with again like all other things they can also overstay their welcome right they can be too good they can break the game they can they can hog the limelight and that's a bit of a challenge uh i love items that do strange things and you don't know why like this dagger can't be unsheathed and vibrates ominously in certain contexts why there's no clue yeah I, adding mystery to items is important i think especially for items that you consider kind of more of a signature of your campaign like adding uh, abilities that they don't quite understand yet or it does this and then you feel like there's more but we're not quite it doesn't quite do it yet that's uh that's really interesting uh, in the development process, how much concern is given to making the items work well within the narrower context of organized play and society play? Uh, you know, I, uh, talking about core engine design for Pathfinder is a bit beyond the scope of this. 
Um, I would say that, you know, uh, building items for a broader play where there is no focus GM is a lot more difficult because you really do actually have to sit down and think about how it's going to mix with the entire rest of the game system. It's a, it's just a bigger challenge. Um, yeah, I, I, I could talk all day about building a campaign for mass players um, because I helped grow the uh, Living Greyhawk campaign from nothing to what it became. Uh, I was uh, a voice in the start of PFS, but I never ran it. Um, but that that's perhaps for a, a different video at some point in the future. Um, that, like, eight people will find interesting. Um, how do you keep campaign, uh, campaign balance and interesting if you like to let your players be more wealthy than their level should be? I tend to either get encounters that they walk through or money cannot make up the power difference. Yeah, I, I think you, you can always run into the challenge of I've given away too much... <laughs> like, uh, it, so on the upside, depending on the game system, eventually, if you just turn off the spigot and prevent them from getting more stuff, at least not very much more stuff, the game will catch up to them, right? So there is one way, which is the natural way that the players won't necessarily feel bad about is just let the game catch up to them. Don't give them anything cool for a little bit. Um, however... If that's not an option, if you've really gone way too far and it's going to take like five levels for the game to catch up, yeah, you're probably going to want to start looking at other ways to mitigate their wealth and power. There's lots of ways you can do this. Many of them are tricks that a GM can only pull once on a group and then they don't trust you anymore. Like, you know, I mean, oh yeah, you guys got robbed. Ha ha ha, half your stuff disappeared. I think th there's no good answer here that isn't going to let the, let the players feel a little irked by what you're doing. Um, I, I, one of my favorites is just, yeah, the town that they are based in has decided that these fancy, rich adventurers who walk around like they own the place because they literally can um, are too much of a problem. And now the, the town is going to start taxing them. Uh, and the tax collector is going to come by and he's going to demand a cut of their adventuring profits. This town keeps getting attacked by monsters and stuff because the adventurers are here and they need money to pay for more guards and they need money to equip their guards better in case the, you know, the barbarian in the party gets drunk and they have to go apprehend him. They need powerful magic items to do that because he can tear their guards limb from limb, right? And maybe the players don't want to pay it. Maybe they're like, no, we're not going to pay it. And they're like, fine, you have to leave. And moving is expensive. There's no way out of them having to cash in some of their items and wealth to to solve this problem. So there's there's lots of ways around it. Um, usually it's uh, I usually like to advise, well, learn your lesson, figure out a way to solve this particular problem, and then pay closer attention in the future. Uh, any tips for giving out cursed items? Um, you know, uh, cursed items are fall into a really interesting place in the game. On one hand, um, they can be fascinating. Uh, from a narrative standpoint. But I actually think they're a real big challenge for the GM to hand out and not have the players feel like you're tricking them. That you are... It, it, it's like when they walk into the dungeon and they haven't seen a single trap and then all of a sudden there's a trap that kills one of the party members. Like, they feel betrayed because you subverted their expectations. When you're handing out magic items and one of them ends up being cursed, you've done it again. You've subverted what they expected from the magic items. It's not the natural order of things. They get magic items, they get more powerful, cool. And all of a sudden they can become very suspicious. Now that said, I think the proper way to use a deadly trap or the proper way to use a cursed item is to foreshadow it, is to give them a sense that something's not right. Oh, that, that werewolf had this sword that he was using, that's weird. Well, the sword converts lycanthropy. And, you know, when you claimed it, now you knew. It was a werewolf using a sword. He shouldn't have been using a sword. He should have been using his claws. Um, so, like, there are ways that you can use these that is kind of more responsible and that the players don't necessarily feel like you're trying to, you know, trick them. I think the moment the players feel like you're trying to trick them, that's when um, you, you've got a problem. But as far as designing cursed items, I think designing them is about finding a way to hamper the PCs in a way that doesn't um, entirely make them ineffective at the things that they're supposed to be doing in the party. A fun cursed item is one that uh, gives them cool role-playing opportunities and hinders them in 
spe very specific ways. Oh, yeah, sorry, whenever you're, whenever you're in, in combat, you have to sing. Which means, you know, or the sword sings, right? You know, great. It's going to prevent you from stealthing. You know, you're not going to be able to hide in combat. That's a terrible thing to saddle the rogue with, though. Because <laughs> right? now they are, they are in trouble. And that's the hardest part about cursed items, is that they're oftentimes um, character contextualized. Bad for some, irrelevant for others. Oh, the wizard has it. Who cares? Right? Oh, the wizard has a singing sword. All right. Sure. How do I encourage players to treat their care, uh, their items like their characters would? It always bothers me when players sell their warlord sword like any other plus two weapon. I think some of that is just inherent in the system. Oh, this is my father's sword. Well, I got a better sword, so I sold it. You know, meh, whatever. Uh, we solved that by just being like, yeah, there's runes. You just transfer the rune to your father's sword. You keep using your father's sword. That's what you want. Um, so I think that's really, um, that's really smart. Um, I don't think there's any other way around it. Um, the, the other thing is to have items grow and change in power over time. Um, runes certainly will get you there. But if it's not an item that gets runes, oh, it's just a ring. Uh, the ring can have more powers that grow with it over time as well. That's okay. Dragon uh, Spirits is asking, how important, if at all, in the process do you feel... That amazing pictures, images, and attentions to detail like cultural influences on items uh, is to making them more impactful. I, I think if if your world supports that, then that's great. That's really smart. Like having, oh, this is clearly a dwarven item because of the, it just its look. Um, the, 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 the way that the stone is carved on the Warhammer's head is clearly dwarven make, right? I think that's a lot of fun. Um, I don't think it's mandatory. I think sometimes a, a, a cigar is just a cigar and it can it can just be the thing. It doesn't need uh, that. But I think as whenever you're building anything, the more you can pour into it, the more you're going to get out of it. Uh, but it has to be relevant. I think that's the biggest challenge with um, doing some of that stuff. As, as, as someone designing things for a game, it's real easy to kind of get lost in my own magnificence, right? Look at all this lore I wrote. Well, if the players have no way of actually accessing that lore or understanding it, then does it really matter? Is it really important if they, they, they will never get the context of it? It can be. Now, maybe later on in the future they get context of it, and that's great. But they may not from the get-go, and that's a bit of a problem. Um, I think art of that sort of stuff is really cool. Um, I... I, I oftentimes like to give art for signature items you know i i myself will sketch out cool looking items and include that as handouts and stuff not everybody has that ability but you know it's it's one google search away to find something that's cool um so yeah yeah yeah, yeah. all right i think we have time for like maybe one more i think i think we got time for just one more question so if anybody has one now is your chance i will say that uh this lecture just like all the other lectures have been a blast uh for those of you uh who have been watching this channel uh, i do videos once a week uh they are uh, here live on the twitch channel uh but then they get uploaded to youtube on monday so um there is a backlog of these now if you want to check them out uh i've talked about npcs and villains and uh basics of world building all, the, all a bunch of great topics we're going to keep doing these as long as folks uh, keep being interested in them um do i recommend thematic relics to characters um uh, i i mean yes I, I i'm i think those come in one of two varieties it's either thematic to the character or it's thematic in addition to the character um if it is thematic to the character it has to have a damn good reason for existing right oh it's oh you're you're the you know the seventh uh, son of the you know lost king and this was the item that was supposed to be given to him it's tied to your bloodline and has cool abilities that are tied to you that's nifty that makes sense um but you know oh it's this random item you found in this ancient tomb and it just happens to have everything you need that feels really off like it just feels like too much gm manipulation the 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 gm's finger is on the scales pushing it one way in a way that is obvious and uh i, I think as gm you're 
you, one of your prime goals is to influence the world in ways that feel natural and organic and not like you're just meddling to make the story artificially into what you want it to be. So, I think that is going to about do it here for today, everybody. I want to thank you all for watching. This series has been a lot of fun for me to put together. Um, make sure to like and subscribe uh, to the channel if you want to see more. Uh, like I said, these videos uh, occur every Saturday on my Twitch channel, and they get loaded up to YouTube on Mondays. So if you want to partake, if you want to uh, be a part of the Q&As, make sure to stop by at 4 p.m. Pacific. Uh, you can find me uh, here on YouTube, uh, on Twitch, on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, all of it backslash Jason Bullman. That's J-A-S-O-N-B-U-L-M-A-H-N. Uh, so thank you for watching, everybody, and we will see you next time.